How are you guys doing tonight? Hey, I just wanted to uh, just properly introduce myself. My name is uh, Jonas, not Joseph. Um, Abby, I'm sorry, I just, I had to do that. Let's give Abby a round of applause. She did an amazing job, great job. If you wanna call me Joseph, call me whatever you want. Um, but my real name is Jonas, so I prefer that. But tonight we're wrapping up our mini series. This was a two week series um, on artificial intelligence. I'm sad that tonight's ending, but next week we have our camp preview night. So you guys excited for that? Okay, okay. Now, if you didn't hear what they said earlier, we're dropping a t-shirt next week. I'm modeling it tonight. It's actually puff printed. So super, super sick. Make sure you bring some money. Um, the price actually, we haven't de officially determined the price for it yet. So bring like 35-ish dollars, somewhere in there. And uh, we'll be posting about it on social media though. So follow us on social media to keep um, with the updates on the shirt price and all that good stuff. Are you guys doing good, actually? Okay, awesome. Well, hey, last week, um, Pastor Kim spoke an incredible message, and she talked about what artificial intelligence actually is and whether or not it is a good thing or a bad thing. But something that I, I believe we can all agree on is, is not that artificial intelligence is necessarily good or bad, but it's what we do with it. It's how we interact with it um, that can be a good or a bad thing. Because right now, as, as we all know, we live in a very technologically advanced world and society where it seems as if our knowledge, our intelligence, our wisdom is increasing at a rapid rate. Now, yesterday, um, Apple just dropped this brand new product on us called Apple Vision Pro. Did anybody see that? If you didn't see it, here it is right here. The new Apple Vision Pro headset. It is absolute, like this looks like something from like the year 3000. Um, I don't know how this is becoming a thing now, but it's kind of scary if you think about it. But this device is absolutely insane. It's revolutionary, um, the technology that is coming out nowadays. Um, also, if you didn't know, this device is going to be like almost $4,000 or something like that. So I'm sure none of us are going to have this thing. But if you do, please let me know because I'd love to borrow it. But virtual reality, artificial intelligence technology is increasing at a rapid rate, uh, rate right now. Um, but here's a quote from Apple's CEO on the new headset that's coming out. He said this. He said, today marks the beginning of a new era for computing. Just as the Mac introduced us to personal computing and the iPhone introduced us to mobile computing, Apple Vision Pro introduces us to spatial computing. Built upon decades of Apple innovation, Vision Pro is years ahead and unlike anything created before with a revolutionary new input system and thousands of groundbreaking innovations. It unlocks incredible experiences for all of our users and exciting new opportunities for our developers. Now, has anybody seen the movie Ready Player One? I, that's, that's like probably a top five movie for me. I love that movie. But that's what this reminds me of. Um, it's absolutely crazy the times that we are living in right now. Uh, the virtual world or the artificial world, whatever you want to call it, that's being created with a headset like this or the metaverse that we're learning about, it can be a scary thing if we aren't careful. The Oxford Dictionary actually describes the word artificial as this. Artificial is made or produced by human beings rather than occurring naturally, especially as a copy of something that is natural. So what this means for artificial intelligence or AI um, and augmented reality is that it is a man-made thing. And typically it's produced as a copy of what the real thing is. So like I said earlier, it's important for us to remind ourselves and to remember that we cannot make an idol out of this. And we cannot put it before God. So very quickly tonight, I'm going to go through three things to know when it comes to artificial intelligence. Now I'm going to fly through these three things because I want you guys to really dive into small group questions tonight. So can you do me a favor? Can all of you get your notes out? Um, can you lean forward a little bit in your chairs? Can you just take notes and can you guys get ready to go on this journey with me? Can you guys do that? I'm going to take a drink of water. <clears throat> Albuquerque air is like so dry. I don't know. I'm not used to it. But Three, three things to know when it comes to artificial intelligence. The first thing to know is this. Number one, we cannot lean on our own understanding. We cannot lean on our own understanding. Very 
famous scripture in the Bible. We read in, in Proverbs chapter three, verse five, it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Now, if you didn't know, um, which I didn't really like think about this a whole lot till I got to Bible school, uh, but the Bible was not written in the, the language that we all know and speak today. It was not written in English or Spanish or any common tongue that we see here, but the Bible was written in a language called Hebrew. So it's so important for us to remember, not that English, English uh, translation of the Bible is perfect in its ways, but we have to look back to the original text when we are studying scripture in order to further the context of what it's talking about. So I want to break down that phrase for you um, at the end of verse 5 there, your own understanding. The original word that's used here is this word called bina. Everybody say bina. Now bina means do not lean on your own knowledge, your own understanding, your own wisdom, or your own intelligence. So when I say that word, when we talk about artificial intelligence, you could replace that word intelligence with, with knowledge, um, with understanding, with wisdom, with intellect, whatever word you want to throw there, you can put it there because it fits perfectly. So Solomon, Solomon was the son of David. He's actually the one that wrote the book of Proverbs. And we see and we read that when Solomon first came to the throne of his father David, the kingdom of, of Israel at the time was at the pinnacle and the peak of its power and its glory. And at this point, it was one of the most, if not the most, and the strongest and most well-built kingdoms in the entire world. So when Solomon became king of Israel, which was around 970 BC, God said to him and asked him, he said, Solomon, ask of me what you will. Or basically God was saying, I want to give you something, but all you have to do is ask for it and I will provide it for you. So this was what Solomon's prayer was in 2 Chronicles chapter 1. He said, Lord, give me now wisdom and knowledge to go out and to come in before this people for who can govern this people of yours, which is so great. And then God's response here is so, so fascinating. When you continue to read in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, God answered Solomon, because this was in your heart and you have not asked for possessions or wealth or honor or the life of those who hate you, and you have not even asked for long life, but have asked for what? For wisdom and knowledge for yourself, that you may govern my people over whom I have made you king. And then verse 12 says, wisdom and knowledge are now granted to you. And then it says, I will also give you riches, possessions, and honor, such as none of the kings who were before you and none after you shall have the like. So obviously God here grants his wish because he was asking for the right thing. Now, later on in Solomon's life, we, we read and we see that he actually didn't even follow his own advice. He didn't follow the, the advice that his, his counsels and his elders were giving him at the time. And I, I believe it's absolute insanity to not follow the advice that he was given. He did not follow after and he did not seek wisdom that can only come from God. But Solomon, we see that he relied on his own intelligence. He relied on his own understanding. And we read about the results of this. If you've ever read or studied the book of Ecclesiastes, it is absolutely a fascinating read. I encourage you to go study it and research this stuff for yourself. But we read about King Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes and what happened because of this. But my point tonight, it's not that intelligence or knowledge or intellect, whatever word you want to throw there, it's not that it's a bad thing. But when we lean on our own human intellect and knowledge, that's when it becomes dangerous. We have to rely on God and his understanding, and that's the only way that it can be a good thing. So Solomon, he was known as a man who had everything, everything in life that you could think of. Solomon, he had it. He had the power, the riches, the wealth, the, everything, but yet he had nothing. He was a man who had everything in life that anybody could possibly wish for, and yet we read that he cried out against the emptiness and the frustration of life because he did not continually seek to gain wisdom and intelligence from God. Now, there was a time when I was little, uh, I was about four, three or four years old, and uh, I had two older sisters. Uh, does anyone have older sisters? Anybody? Man, for all my dudes out there that have older sisters, like, you feel my pain sometimes. Um, sometimes we just, we wanted to, like, rip each other's hair out, and uh, I used to get, like, like, me and my sister Mackenzie, she was two years older than me, um, we were, like, really, really close. Um, but the closer that we were, the more that we fought and we argued, and uh, we actually lived in this house in Texas, and uh, it was a fairly, 
um, large house. I mean, it had like a, a nice patio and all that stuff from what I can remember, uh, remember. But I used to chase her around the house, throughout the house. And then this one time in particular, I was chasing my sister around the house. And she went into the patio and she closed the door and she locked it. Now, there was a problem here because I could not get through the door. But my frustration and my anger didn't go away. So I wanted to get to my sister so I did what anybody would have done in this moment. There's a big glass window on the window. I put my, my hand in a fist and I punched the glass straight through. Now it seemed so logical in the moment because now I could reach through and unlock the door, right? Um, but there was a couple problems. One, I think I like literally broke my hand and shattered it. Um, and two, I found out when I punched the glass and I reached through, there was no lock for me to unlock. I found out that the lock was actually on my side of the door and she was actually just holding the door shut pretending that it was locked now this what I, what I understood though is it would have saved myself a lot of pain it would have saved myself a lot of suffering if I would have understood something that I didn't understand in the moment but I leaned on my own understanding of this locking mechanism and it caused pain and suffering in my life now, this is a very dumb illustration here, but what I want you to think of and, and really pay close attention to tonight is that your own understanding and your own knowledge, it's kind of like a locked door. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is, is God, he is the only one that has the key that can provide the key to unlock the door to your understanding. But you have to lean on him. You have to continually seek him for his supernatural wisdom and understanding in your life because we're human we can only understand things the way that our brain operates so we have to operate in the supernatural in our lives so we can't lean on our own understanding because it will only lead to pain it will only lead to suffering if we are not relying on God for his wisdom for his knowledge and his understanding now the second thing to note tonight again I'm flying through this because I want time for small group questions uh, but the second thing to know when it comes to artificial intelligence is this. Number two, you have to distinguish what is real and what is fake. I'm going to take another sip of water. Uh, you have to distinguish what is real and what is fake. Now, it's just common knowledge. No one would argue this. But the more valuable something is, the more likely it is to be counterfeit or for someone to make a replica of it. Um, I came across this funny video on TikTok like a couple years ago, and I just, I think it kind of sums up this like off-brand replica thing really, really well. So take a look at this video real quick. I found a bunch of generic brands. <laughs> look, Snickers? No, Snickers. <laughs> you want Pringles? No, Pringles. <laughs> Dr. Pepper? No, Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Dr. No, Dr. No, No, Doritos? Legs? Nope. That's so dumb. <laughs> Would anybody buy that stuff though? Like actually? Like maybe just for the memes? I don't know. No, but if we're being serious, if we're being real here tonight, the more expensive something is, the more you want something, the more that it's more likely to be a counterfeit or to be an off-brand thing and a fake thing the more valuable something is. Like, I'm gonna go out and buy some M&Ms probably tonight after service. I'm not gonna buy H&Hs, but I'm gonna be honest. Nobody wants the off-brand stuff because it's not the real thing and it's not authentic. Now, in a world where sometimes it's, it's kind of hard to tell what is real and what is authentic versus what's fake, it's important to know how to distinguish the two from each other. So here's the fact. The bottom line, the truth is this. You can write this down. God is the one who creates, and Satan is the one who takes what God created and he counterfeits it. God is the creator of the world, and Satan is the one that takes what God creates, and he wants so badly to tempt you to, to put this fake thing in front of you because it's, it's, it's a deceitful thing because it is not the real thing. God is the creator, and Satan is the deceiver and the counterfeiter. Now, really fast on, on this point number two, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jet through just five examples really fast of how Satan counterfeits God. You guys ready for this? If you're not, put on your Apple Vision Pros, lock in, let's go. So five examples of how Satan counterfeits God. Number one, we have the unique son of Jesus, and then we have this uh, person called the son of destruction. 
Now, here's the truth, the bottom line. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Jesus, he is the unique one and only son of God. He is the unique one and only son of God, and there is no other. John chapter one says, no one has ever seen God, but God, the what? The one and only who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. We also read that, in a sense, um, in 2 Thessalonians, that, that Satan has his own son called the son of destructions, destruction. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will uh, not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Now, I did some research on it, and this is not the like literal offspring of Satan, but this man that we read about, he is, well, what we see is the counterfeit of Jesus and the real thing. The second example of Satan's counterfeit is number two, the Trinity, the Trinity. Now we all know that, that God is made up of what is called the Trinity, which is God the Father, God the Son, which is Jesus, and then God the Holy Spirit. But we also read in the book of Revelation that Satan actually has his very unholy Trinity of himself, this thing called the beast, and then this uh, false prophet that we read about. So Revelation chapter 20, it says, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake uh, of fire and sulfur, where are also the beast and the false prophet. And they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So Satan, in his own way, in a very unholy and ungodly way, has taken what God has that is perfect, and he has made his own thing. And then the third example of Satan's counterfeit is number three, children. Children. So God, he has his own children that we, that we read about in the book of John, and it's those who have put their entire trust, their entire faith in Jesus Christ. John chapter one says, but as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God, even to them that believe on his name. But on the flip side of that, we also read in the book of Matthew that Satan kind of has his own brand of children. Matthew chapter 13, it says, the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. The weeds are the children of the evil one. Now the fourth example, again, I'm flying through these. The fourth example is number four, apostles, apostles. So we read about in the book of Matthew that, that Jesus, he asked these 12 different disciples to give their life to him, to follow him um, in his ministry. Uh, Matthew chapter 10 says, and he called unto himself, Jesus called unto himself his 12 disciples, and he gave them all authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of disease and all manner of sickness. But then again, we see that Satan, the deceiver, the liar, he does his, his thing where he kind of has his own apostles in a way. Second Corinthians chapter 11, it says, for much men are false apostles. They are deceitful workers, fashioning themselves into apostles of Christ. These are people that they may look like they're living the Christian lifestyle and, and doing the godly thing, but they are in fact a counterfeit of the real deal. And then the fifth and, and last way that Satan counterfeits God is number five with marks. Marks. Now what do I mean by, by marks? Basically, what, I, what I'm saying here is, is God, he, he demonstrates this seal of his ownership across his servants that are going to be represented with this mark on their forehead. And the Bible actually records an angel saying this in the book of Revelation chapter 7. It says, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Now, again, in the same way, on the flip side of that, Satan actually will have his own form of ownership and mark placed upon his followers as well. We read about it again in Revelation chapter 13. It says, and he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, and the free and the bond, that there will be given them a mark on their right hand or upon their forehead. So throughout the entire Bible, all the way from Genesis to Revelation, there's this theme that, that God is the creator, it's perfect in its own way, and then Satan takes the perfect creation that God has created, and he flips it on its head, and he wants to deceive you and lie to you and tell you that the fake thing is the real thing, but it is not true, because God is the one who creates, and Satan cannot create. Satan can only manipulate and deceive you. The third thing tonight, as I'm kind of wrapping up, the third thing to know when it comes to artificial intelligence is this, is number three, what you feed 
into your life will determine the algorithm of your life. What you feed into your life will determine the algorithm of your life. Now, the truth here is that the Bible so clearly speaks to us is is this fact of we reap what we sow. Whatever we sow into, that's the harvest that we are going to reap. I mean, it's undeniable. The things that you sow into your life, whether it's now or later, at some point, you are going to reap a harvest of what you sow. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, it says, do not be deceived. It says what? Do not be what? Deceived. Do not be deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh or his own desires will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now, I think sometimes as Christians, we often get this, we have this wrong mentality about this sort of thing because I, I, I really do believe with my whole being that the more that you fixate on something or the more you fixate on not doing something, the more likely you are to do that thing. That's just because we're human. Like if I tell you all right now, hey, don't think of a ginormous gray elephant. What are you guys all thinking about right now? A big gray elephant. You could tell your brain all day long not to think of that thing, but the more you tell your brain not to think of it, you're gonna think of it even more. So. When we are struggling to stop sowing to our flesh, what we have to understand is we, we need to really double down and, and not just think about doing the wrong thing, but we need to, to, to double down and sow to the Holy Spirit, to sow to the kingdom of God. Because when you fixate your mind on sowing to the kingdom things, that is the harvest that you are going to reap in your life. Now, as I end tonight, I, I'm going to address something that, that really needs to be addressed, and I'm not going to shy away th- from the truth because I'm not scared about it. I know what the Bible says. But I'm going to talk about something tonight. It's kind of like a curse word in church. It's called pornography. Pornography. Now, we're going to get real serious real quick because I don't have a whole lot of time left. But statistics would say that 9 out of 10 people in this room have either watched pornography or are constantly watching pornography right now in your life. Now, I was doing some research on this subject. And the statistics that you come across and the articles that you read about are absolutely heartbreaking and mind-blowing. I came across this article from Common Sense Media. They did a research poll on teenagers who had seemingly watched porn unintentionally in their lives. And these are the stats that they came up with, is that nearly half or 44% of the teenagers that they surveyed said they had watched porn unintentionally. Unintentionally. That means they didn't intentionally go to their web browser and search some, some stuff up. But somehow, in some way, they unintentionally, without intention, watched some sort of pornographic material. Now, I was thinking about this a little bit more, and the more you study this stuff and research, it's, it's fascinating what comes to light. But in the early 2000s, um, this is the time that people typically access the internet from a stationary desktop computer, and there was nothing else. Does anyone know um, what came out a little bit later on in 2007? Does anyone know? The iPhone, the iPhone, this thing right here. Boom, that's what it used to look like, which is crazy. But this thing came out in 2007. Now, what's so fascinating, and we read about it in the article, at the time, this was the Vision Pro of the time. It was revolutionary to the internet access that we had. I mean, before this, think about it. You had to either like go to the library or go to like the family room where the desktop was, and there was like no way you could watch like bad stuff on there because it was in a public setting. You couldn't like really do stuff in private. But when this thing came out, it completely changed the game. It completely changed the game and it revolutionized the online world. So I want you to think about tonight. I want you to think about the hours and hours that we spend on our phones every single day. I mean, after this, after small group tonight and you go home, I want you to go on your phone, go to your settings and look at the screen time that you have on your phone every day. I guarantee you, guarantee you, most of us in the room are at 10 plus hours a day, 10 plus. You don't have to do it right now, but go home and, 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 and look at it. But even if you don't spend 10 hours a day, you spend at least a couple hours a day on your phones, and I wanna tell you this. Listen up real quick. Don't get out your phones. Hold on. I'm not done. The, the truth is, listen, what we view for just a moment, what we feed into and what, what we sow our seed into for just a moment, that is what's gonna feed the algorithm of your life. Maybe you're here tonight and you've gotten to this place where you don't really understand 
how you've gotten to this place where you are bound by a pornography addiction. Or maybe outside of pornography, you, you are bound by a sinful addiction that you know you need to get out of and you don't know how you can do it. I want you to ask yourself some questions tonight. Okay, you ready for this? What TV shows and movies are you watching on a daily basis? What are they? You don't have to say it out loud, but think about it for a moment. There's some really popular shows and, and, and movies that are awesome, but they have some stuff in there that you should not be watching. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, oh, it's not that big of a deal, it's just one movie. Well, one movie leads to another movie, leads to another movie. You go online and you search something up about it, and now, just like these teenagers, you have unintentionally gotten to this place where you're looking at stuff that you should not be looking at. What are you sowing your seed into? You know, Kim mentioned last week that as soon as you watch a show on Netflix or any kind of movie streaming platform, once you're done with that movie, what happens right after you're done? The recommendations come up of, of things that are similar to that content that you were watching. And what's fascinating is it's all formed by artificial intelligence. It's, it's insane, the stuff that is happening in our world. Another question would be, what kind of music are you listening to? Now, this one might seem like a small thing too, but if you look about it, Pastor Dustin mentioned this on a Sunday a while back, but if you look at the top 10 songs on the charts right now, if you look at the lyrics and the words, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be honest with you, a lot of it is just a bunch of crap. It is not healthy. It is not good to feed your soul with that stuff. What kind of music, what kind of podcasts, what kind of things are you pouring into your life? Is it worth pouring into or not? Another question would be, what kind of pictures, what kind of videos are you interacting with on social media? Majority of, the, of you in the room, you're active on, on Snapchat, on TikTok, on Instagram. Now, the interesting thing about TikTok is everything that you see on your For You page is formed by an algorithm of what you interact with. So what you're commenting on, what you're liking, what you're sharing, it may seem like a small thing, but that's what's feeding the algorithm that you're viewing. So let me ask you, what are you viewing? What are you interacting with on social media? Is it a good thing? To all my boys, what are you interacting with on social media? Are you liking pictures and videos and sending stuff that you shouldn't be sending to other people or not? Ladies, same thing for you. What are you interacting with on social media? Because the truth of the matter is, no matter how small or insignificant it seems, it is a big deal. It is a big deal. And I wanna challenge you tonight. I'm not here to, to just give you a little pat on the back and tell you you're doing a good job. I'm here to, to encourage you and to challenge you to do the right thing. Because if I don't do that, who's gonna do it? You think the government's gonna do it? You think someone at your school is gonna do it, one of your teachers? Mm -mm. Nope, they're not gonna do it for you. So it's up to us tonight to make a, a decision and a declaration that I'm gonna be different from everybody else. And the stuff that I feed into my life is gonna be a good and a godly thing because the harvest that I'm gonna reap is gonna be a good and a godly thing. Amen? Amen. So I wanna ask you tonight, will you continue to interact with things that will harm you or that will bring life to you? As I close tonight, I wanna to give a couple of people in the room an opportunity to pray as you close your head and, or not close your head, close your eyes and bow your head. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm dyslexic, okay? I wanna get, no, seriously, I wanna give someone an opportunity tonight to make a decision. You cannot go another week without making a decision to invest into godly things. But if you're here tonight and you are struggling, it doesn't have to be just pornography. Maybe you're struggling with um, an alcoholic addiction or maybe you're struggling with pride. Maybe you're struggling with, I don't know what it is. You know what it is between you and God. If you are struggling with something tonight that you feel like you're not reaping um, or you're not sowing into a good thing, would you just slip your hand up really quick for me? Nobody looking around. If you need prayer tonight and you need to break free from that, I see your hands all across the room. All across the room. You can put your hands down. Another group of people that I want to pray for tonight is someone that has never accepted Jesus, the one and only, into their lives. I want to give you that opportunity tonight. And I want, I want to tell you before I ask you to put your hand up for me, I want to tell you that this is the absolute best decision that you could ever make in your entire life. Jesus wants, he has a plan for you. But the truth is, 
Satan has a plan for you as well. And so it's important for us to understand that Jesus is a loving father. He's a loving father. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life. It doesn't matter what you walked into this room with. Jesus wants to meet you where you are tonight. So if that's you, you wanna accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm gonna encourage you on the count of three to lift your hand up. This is just so that I can pray for you and then you can put it right back down. If that's you, you wanna accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, would you slip your hand up for me? One, two, three. Awesome, I see your hands, I see your hand. I see you. You can put your hands right back down. Now tonight as I pray, I don't want this to just be my words, but I, I want you in your own words. Again, no distractions, nobody looking to your left and your right, between you and God right now. Guys, the Bible says that we are not promised tomorrow. So I wanna ask you, are you right with God tonight? Doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter the weight that you feel right now. What matters is this moment, this moment with Jesus. He can break you, break you free from addictions. He can break you free from this fake thing in the world. He wants to give you the real thing. It's a love that surpasses all understanding. So tonight, as I pray, I want you to Make this your own prayer. And if you wanna accept Jesus into your heart, all you have to do is make that decision for yourself. Let me pray for you tonight, and then we'll move on into small groups. God, thank you so much for this opportunity that we have, God, to just learn more about you, Father. God, I pray for anybody tonight that wants to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. God, I pray that they would understand that this is the best decision they could ever make. God, would you just meet them where they are right now? Jesus, would you come into their lives? Would you make them a brand new creation? And God, would you challenge them and encourage them to sow into a good soil so that they can reap the harvest in their lives? God, I pray for anybody that's in the room tonight that is bound by a pornography addiction, an alcohol addiction, an addiction that they feel like they can't get free from. God, I pray that right now in the name of Jesus, you would break free them from that addiction, Father. God, that they can live a life of peace, of knowledge and understanding and knowing more about you. God, we love you so much. We're so thankful for this opportunity, God, to learn more about who you are. We love you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.